I'm Wilfred Barry, and I'm a partner in SJB Group. In 2016, the company made an investment in LiDAR scanning videography. It was about a $130,000 investment. Um, it was sort of wrenching in that a lot of technology, a lot of data, uh, but we got, we got over that hurdle and we now use it for aerial and truck mounted scanning. We generate point clouds, we generate digital elevation models. Along with that, we have panorama videography and we use that to archive and view um, whenever the, the need is. And from that videography and LIDAR, we can do feature extraction. The work that we do is in general compliance with the Florida Department of Transportation Surveying and Mapping Handbook for Highway Scanning. Florida and California are sort of the leaders in uh, this technology, and Florida has laid it out the instructions to consultants, which we generally follow. So surveying and mapping since the time of the pyramids has used all various kinds of tools and I'm sure any time that they implemented a new tool uh, in their time, it was considered radical, um, but it was probably ingenious in their application. And today what you see on the right is what we're using. Uh, we have used airboats before, backpack mounted uh, LIDAR, LIDAR in a helicopter, and then the, the sort of the Google camera uh, equipment that we mount in our truck. And then we also mount LiDAR on a, a drone, a DJI uh, M600. And of course it has its own camera system. So talking about technology, technology uh, again is, uh, you know, you can be the bleeding edge, it can drive you crazy. And to some degree, I think we were part of that, although uh, we certainly didn't invent it, but we did follow it. And so, uh, but technology, just like in this particular um, cartoon, can be difficult. Uh, this particular cartoon I thought was applicable because of what we're going through now with uh, the polarization of our culture. Um, so, but here it is. All right. So survey light. Why, why, are we, why do we do this? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about surveying while driving. Uh, it's not exactly like a whistle while we work kind of thing because there's a lot of preparation. But as part of that effort, we have videography. We have LIDAR scanning. We'll talk about accuracies, the benefits. We'll talk about workflow. We'll talk about one or two examples. And then there are three deliverables in this particular concept. There's basic scope, there's basic scope with SUE, which kind of gets uh, the underground. Basic scope is above ground, on the ground. And then when we add SUE, we get below the ground. And then the last tool that we'll add to the toolbox is called feature extraction. And then we'll talk about another uh, web hosted uh, tool that is called LIDAR and image data fusion. All right, urbanization. As we add to our civilization, uh, we go from rural to suburban to urban. And it just, every time you go to one growth level, uh, you're adding more and more clutter. Uh, we call it ground clutter, above and below the ground. Makes topographic research mapping ever, ever, ever more important. So we all know now, uh, because 811 is just bombarding us with the message about what's under the ground. But anyway, accurate details of above and below the ground are paramount to the designer and to the contractor. Surveying while driving. So we have been surveying for DOTD for a good 30 years now. Um, the, the things that we do to get work done is really amazing. Um, we all know now that we have to know how to do temporary traffic control uh, when working for DOD and why. It's the safety of the public. It's the safety of the worker. Um, it's to protect life and property. Well, prior to all of that, I mean, we've had, if you're working on a narrow road and we're surveying, we've had a couple of people get hit by um, mirrors, side view mirrors. Uh, they didn't get hurt. Another time we had um, a total station working close to the, the, the highway um, traffic lane. And luckily we had a person uh, that had stepped away to make notes. But what happened is a driver hit an orange barrel and the orange barrel then bounced and took out our total station. 
if he would have been there, he would have gotten hurt. All right, so enough about safety. If we can avoid putting our worker in the uh, traffic lanes, then we're doing a better job for our people and the public. So when you, and then when you shut down a lane, we all know it doesn't take much to disrupt traffic. It gets choked up. And again, if we can avoid that, we're, we're all better off. So there you see our truck uh, and then the system uh, close up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those items. All right, panorama videography. This is a camera made by FLIR. Uh, FLIR is a renowned manufacturer of cameras and sensors, infrared, uh, all sorts of uh, sensors. This particular camera is five sensors in the horizontal, each of them five megabits, and then there's one point straight up, total 30 megabits of frame. This generates a panorama image that you can view um, you really can't print a uh, bubble image, but you can the panorama, and I'll show you that. But this captures uh, videography at two frames a second. They all fire off at the same time. This is what those uh, images look like. The bottom one is a, is a panorama image, and it goes from zero to 360 degrees. You see the cab of the, of the truck on the left, cab of the truck on the right, and then um, you see all the streets in between. And then the, the top left, you can see a bubble image. And this is a uh, Plank Road. Uh, we surveyed Plank Road for the shelter stops that uh, Katz is planning. And the top right, you see um, a focus, drill down image of one part of that intersection. You're looking at the, um, the ADA mat, uh, the sensor mat for blind people. Uh, you see cracks, you see a lot of stuff. And you can look at this at any time, uh, store it, go back to it, go up, go down the street with it, just like uh, Google Street View, and uh, except this is just about as current as you can get. We use this imagery in the LIDAR to do uh, the city parishes self-evaluation for ADA um, deficiencies in, um, in a lot of their streets. All right, LIDAR. LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. The, um, the LIDAR scanner, which is what you see, the Belladine cylinder on the left, um, it, it measures where objects are in 3D space by virtue of a laser uh, light burst emitting from the sensor and then coming back to the sensor. And the, the time of travel of that light is uh, divided by half, two, uh, is corresponds to the distance. And so there are 32 lasers, uh, different beam spreads, as you see on the right, that are shooting at 700,000 points a second. Most of that goes off into the atmosphere and so it doesn't actually get reflected back. Thus, it doesn't really constitute an observation. But there are dust particles out there in the air. And so you get this uh, little bit of dust scatter. Uh, you can filter that out. So the 700,000 points a second you know, winds up being the 300,000 points a second range. And uh, I don't know if I said, but that cylinder is spinning at, at uh, 20 revolutions a second. And we track where that is in 3D space and its orientation. It's all part of the process. All right, so LIDAR and GPS. We run the scanner uh, on a truck moving down the road at generally posted speeds. Uh, the slower you go, the more data you pick up in the same uh, given space. Uh, so typically we're driving a little bit slower. We're always, uh, when we process the data, we're always referencing it against a core station, which you see on the right, or a, a local uh, base station, GPS base station running uh, while we are um, scanning. So that device we call Snoopy. Uh, this is manufactured by LIDAR USA. Um, the owner, Jeff, um, Jeff Fagerman, is a true entrepreneur. He is a land surveyor graduating in photogrammetry. Um, it's a family operation. They integrate the systems together. Uh, the, the LIDAR scanner is uh, Belladyne, uh, which autonomous driving use a lot of these and their uh, rush to develop autonomous driving. Ford is a big investor in Belladyne. So, the, the box though on the left um, has the smarts of the uh, device. There's actually a, 
a small computer running in there. But there's an onboard INS, which is inertial navigation system. It's actually it's sort of like rocket science in truth, but it tracks where everything is, where it's been, where it's going. And the inertial measurement unit is a small little processor. It's just tiny, 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 uh, smaller than a dime. And it it's tracking every movement, both in any direction and also angular rotation. And it's that processor that lets it track uh, the orientation and movement. And from there, we process all of the, uh, the data. LiDAR USA uh, wrote their own processing software. Amazing little company. They're growing quite fast. Okay, accuracies. This is a big deal. We wouldn't do this if it wasn't accurate, right? So for paved surfaces, uh, the reflection and the points observed are not nearly as noisy as grassy surfaces. Every surface has a random uh, surface nature to itself, uh, but paved surfaces are not, are more even, um, more planar, if we can call it that, whereas grassy has vegetation at various heights. So you're gonna get a noise on grassy surfaces, but there are software that will uh, look at all those observations and come to a conclusion about where in grass or where the, where the bare earth is, because uh, that's what we really want to know. Uh, we don't really care really much about the grass. But nevertheless, without control uh, being present in the observations, paved surfaces are going to be about 0.1 to 0.2 feet accurate, and then grass is 0.2 to 0.4 feet. If we have control, and we'll talk about that shortly, uh, it improves dramatically, 0.05 to 0.1 for paved, and then grassy 0.1 to 0.2. As a frame of reference, what we're trying to do here DOTD in its location and survey handbook requires accuracies of 0.01 feet vertical for, um, for design purposes. So we're not getting there. Uh, we, get, we get really close. Uh, we've done some scanning for our DOTD and we can, we can get to 0.05. It is repeatable and uh, they've gotten comfortable with using our, our services for scanning. Uh, we've done some of that for Barksdale. Uh, I won't bore you with all the project names, but we've probably done about 15 uh, scanning projects for DOTD for paved surfaces. All right, so the data acquisition standards. Uh, Louisiana in itself does not have its own standards yet. I'm sure they're gonna work on it. They bought recently a mobile uh, LIDAR scanning unit, uh, but nevertheless, we look to leadership in other states until that happens. Florida and California are two of the leaders in having standards that govern how you scan uh, both aerially from airplanes or from um, vehicle mounted equipment. So they, um, they have a publication, it's called Terrestrial Mobile LIDAR Surveying and Mapping Guidelines, published in 15. Uh, we like uh, Florida's uh, protocols, they're clear, uh, unambiguous. And so what happens when we scan, we're gonna divide, we're gonna scan, this is a two lane road. So we're gonna scan in both directions, separated by a certain amount of time uh, that's required for control purposes. But prior to scanning, if it's a DOTD project, we would set out control points that you see on the right on the pavement. And those are shark's teeth, a uh, shark, shark's tooth. That's a typical uh, highway um, marking. It's, uh, although it doesn't look like it from here, but typically it's twice as long as that shortest side. So we clearly know the orientation because we're gonna we're gonna come back either in advance or behind. We're gonna uh, uh, observe that tip uh, with GPS. All right. So setting up for a DOTD roadway, we would have control points every 500 feet. Every other one is used for control, and then once we make adjustments to the data, the other group of, of, of control points that were set is what we call validation. This is very typical of the QAQC process. Uh, we're always gonna have a certain amount of overlap um, and we're always gonna have a visible control, both in terms of control and validation. All right, so what are the benefits of mobile LIDAR? Uh, contrary to what this guy uh, on the far right is doing, uh, it's sort of ironic, you know, he's, you know, it's all about safety. And then he's standing up on his handrail, putting the sign up. That's not what we're about. So look, mobile LIDAR is quick. Um, it's a relative term, but we can get a lot done in one day. Um, 
it's improved safety for both uh, the crews and for uh, the public. Lessons disrupting to the public. It's comprehensive, no need for costly return trips. Okay, that's true to a point. If there's something in shadow, then we missed it. But if we can see it, we got it. And so sometimes there's some uh, planning that's required to make sure we don't have anything in shadow, uh, but typically we get it all. So if you ever have to go back and look at something, uh, you can, the video's there, the LIDAR data is there. It's a great archival tool, which is what I just talked about. Accurate locational data to a tenth of a foot, maybe better with control. Um, data is generated in 3D. Why is that important? Because everything is 3D now. BIM, uh, GIS databases, all the mapping, the CAD software out there is 3D. Used to be um, that you had to convert from 2D because that's, that's what all the drawing platforms were back in the day. In the beginning, it was you know, orthographic views on paper. And if you had 3D, well, it was a profile, right? So now we have all of that. You can cut sections anywhere you want. Uh, that is the coolest thing about it. Cost effective and practical. It is, and I'll tell you how. Scanning workflow, this is typical. We, um, it's not as easy as just, you know, wake up, get on the truck and scan, but there is some preparation. We have to put the equipment mounted on the truck, um, get all the, the um, equipment hooked up. There's a tremendous amount of data. Um, so there's power that has to power everything. Uh, we used um, a, we use a filtered power supply to make sure we get a uh, current that is, um, uh, doesn't vary in voltage or, or amplitude. Okay, so we put it all together. We drive it, like I said, we can probably drive 200 miles a day. Um, it's roughly twice the time to process data as the time it took to scan it. Uh, so we'll take that. We use LiDAR USA software. We pick out visible control and validation. And by the way, this is a survey light workflow. This is not the DOTD workflow. We pick out visible control and validation points from the scans that we know we have observations. And then we go back out with our GPS unit. This is a modem unit. This is not something we're not gonna have a base station. We did compare the data uh, with a base station uh, of a smart network, a core station. So we have good data. But you know, we didn't put a, um, a base station out there. So we go back out, we, we, we observe enough points for control and enough points for validation to where we know what we got. We reprice, reprocess the LIDAR for adjustment to control. We check it against validation. All right, at this point, if there's grass, we can extract ground from the point clouds. If there's paved surfaces, we can extract that. All of that leads to uh, the creation of a digital elevation model. What is a digital elevation model? It's the uh, representation of the ground. It's usually in the form of a grid map. Um, just looking at my time. So, um, and that is importable into all the CAD platforms. We're using TopoDot, which is an, a, um, a uh, CAD application that runs inside Bentley and Rhodes. That software uh, was developed by 3D very strong software, very good software. It's got a lot of control, um, QA, QC features that you can check what your data is and how it looks. This is the control target uh, example that we go back out and observe. This is the parking lot, concrete parking lot. So um, our sensor, the Belladyne sensor, when the light reflects back, there's not only XYZ value, there's an intensity value. We don't get color at this part of the process, but we do get intensity. And so the white produces, the white part of that stripe produces an intensity value that shows up when we look. So we go back out with GPS and see the bottom right, we're gonna take a shot on that point of the arrow. We would probably uh, find another arrow similar, maybe you know, a few hundred feet away and do the same for that and create uh, and use that for, for validation. All right, so here is a project uh, for Ascension Move that we surveyed and designed. Um, it's Roddy Road in Ascension Parish near Galvez. The KMZ file is red. Uh, that's the, our survey limits. It goes from 931 to 933, uh, Joseph Area Road, I think. And so that's our equipment in the middle. So when we scan and videograph, uh, every frame that fires off creates a location and a frame number. And the image you see on the right is essentially an index of all the uh, ladybug 
uh, observations. And so this can be used to go and look, uh, go to the, to the frame quickly uh, to find or look at whatever it is that you want to look at. Very uh, doable, uh, very uh, easy to use. The viewing software uh, that this shows is Ladybug Cat Pro. It's free from FLIR. Um, and so it's um, powerful stuff. Uh, there is a, a bull up of the KML index. So this is Bang Flicklin Road, Bang Ficklin Road at uh, Roddy Road. So in that image, you're seeing uh, the road, Roddy Road on the left. Uh, you see a for rent sign, the street uh, stop sign. You see some sandbags, not sandbags, concrete bags that are some sort of embankment, I'm sure. There's a culvert in there and some guy wires, pedestal, pole. So here's that representation in LIDAR. So this is colorized by height. Uh, blue uh, is low, red is high. And uh, again, you see the overhead power lines. You see that white for rent sign. Not for, yeah, I think it's for rent. And then this is the pedestal. These are the uh, guy wires for the pole, pole, trees, uh, highway markings. And so as another example, these highway markings, we sometimes use them uh, for control and validation, just using the Z value. Uh, the X, Y is not so nearly important as what that elevation is. It's remarkable how good uh, the data is that comes back without adjustment to control by using a core station. Um, it's amazingly accurate in the X, Y. The thing that we, that we almost always massage is um, we adjust against Z values from a GPS observation. All right, so this is a D, an example of that, of a DB, DEM of that same road, same point of view. Uh, we see the red, the blue from the ditch, uh, the top left of the DEM, you're seeing it's a hotter uh, color. That's the crown of the road. And then the bottom left um, is a blow up of everything you see there. And you see a hint of a culvert in there. It's grown over with grass, but there it is. And then you're seeing a, a, a drop of the, this is probably the edge of the pavement going onto the grass. Um, all this data from this particular uh, BEM, you can generate cross sections. Again, blue is a ditch. And then in the middle is the crown of the road, kind of orange yellow. Um, and you can pull sections in any direction as often as you want. Um, it's just amazing uh, what you can do uh, in preparing plan profiles with this information. So the basic scope, we talked about three different scopes. Basic scope is gonna be LAS point cloud. LAS is a file type. Um, that's uh, XYZ with intensity. Standard format. Uh, so you're gonna get point clouds with 0.1 to 0.2 accuracy. You're gonna get a digital elevation model, one foot spacing. Um, you compromise file size with going down to like three inch spacing. It just, uh, file sizes increase exponentially. And one foot sampling is, is great for a DEM. Same accuracy. So you're gonna get the panorama videography. You're gonna get an, uh, an index in a, in a Google Earth KML file. And then if you wanted, uh, we will also add um, georectified aerial imagery that will drop in really well. We have an amazing source of georeferenced uh, imagery that is high resolution. Uh, current and um, amazingly useful. So the next scope, um, you know, you might consider, well, we got above the ground, on the ground, what about below the ground? Uh, you would add SU data at a quality level C uh, to that map. What is quality level C? It is uh, getting all the utility record, uh, the utility owner's records in a given area. You'd contact them, get record maps, uh, you would go out in the field, uh, you would compile uh, a map based on observations, visual observations in the field, walking, um, and you'd put, add that to the, um, the map that we, we talked about above. And then the last one is that you would um, extract surface features, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's done. We don't actually do that piece of it. We have a, a, a vendor, a partner, uh, virtual geomatics, and they will visually uh, digitize all the visible surface features on the ground and above the ground. 
and produce either AutoCAD or Bentley GGN file or an Esri shape file. I'll show you an example of that. So extracting features uh, automatically from point cloud data uh, is the dream of all uh, software developers in this particular space. Um, you know, from looking at point clouds and analyzing it, uh, you know, if you have a definitive shape, uh, you can see that you have a shape. Um, in piping and industrial applications, they've gotten amazingly smart with identifying pipe size, um, valves, et cetera, because they have API standards uh, with which to uh, compare point clouds to, uh, they will drop them in. But even that requires some human interaction because sometimes they pick the wrong thing. So you gotta, you gotta, there has to be some, some human uh, interaction and approval. But in the highway space, um, TopoDot has some automatic features for cross-sectioning, but not really for surface topo, enter virtual geomatics. This is an extraction list um, that is typically used for uh, surface surveys in the highway um, space. If you can read it, you're going to see that we'll pick up edge of pavement. Uh, we'll pick up all markings, driveways, building footprints, guardrails. I'm reading it. You can too. Uh, we'll have all the striping. We'll pull all the uh, pedestals, signage, um, all of these things, sewer manholes, any kind of valve. If they can see it, it's going to go into the database. This is an example of an AutoCAD drawing of a street in slide L that we scanned for a utility piping contractor. He wanted to document, he didn't have anything to do with this particular product, but we scanned it on his behalf because he wanted to document pre-construction uh, conditions on a road prior to laying pipe. So we took that data and uh, we, we shared it with virtual geomatics and they produced an AutoCAD file. As you can see here, uh, you're seeing all of the the uh, stripe uh, street markings. Uh, this is going to be edge of pavement. Um, you've got top of ditch. There's guy wires. Uh, you have storm inlets. Um, there's street poles, vegetation. And so all that is importable as a DXF file. And now we're, we're getting somewhere, right? All right, this is an example of the same thing in Esri. Those are shape files uh, that are um, above uh, imagery that Esri imported. So it laid in really well, really well. All right, so virtual ge geomatics is one more tool in the toolbox. LiDAR and image data fusion. This is a system where they marry the data against the videography and it creates a tool by which users can not only view, but they can measure um, all of the the uh, surface features are, are um, they have symbology. Uh, you can click on them and it's got uh, attributes that talk about what it is, how high it is, and I'll show you that. But you can also view and measure. Um, and the things I'm gonna show you would be great uh, for, in other words, if a city has this or like LSU has this, you get, uh, a database of the entire um, compound or roadway. Um, let's keep going. So this is the portal um, that we have and it, you run that, it loads up and you get uh, imagery like this. And I'm gonna show y'all uh, in a second. These, uh, the, the extraction list is what you see on the left. Once you load up all the extraction items, you start seeing um, representation of stripe, uh, striping on the pavement. Uh, you see the edge of pavement. Uh, there's a pole here. Let's keep going. All right, that's the symbology that you see while you're in the viewer. All right, I've got to share another screen. And y'all think I'm crazy, I'm not. Uh, so this is um, portal. I'm trying to get a full screen. I can't. All right, so let's launch it. So we're going to this. Uh, this is exactly what Lady 
uh, Bug Cat Pro does. Um, same manner of displaying imagery. But for example, when you have this kind of bubble panorama imagery available, you can see cracks. Uh, you can see everything, see all of this. So it's a great archiving uh, reference tool. Um, all right, so this particular, this is web-based. So they take the data, they marry it, and then they, um, they digitize, extract everything, and they put it on their web server. And so now we have access to it. Not only, who is we? It could be for a project team uh, for UVR. It could have been uh, the prime and all the such, uh, rather than them hosting it and sharing it, which can be very difficult because it's an enormous amount of data. Virtual Geomatics does this and anybody can log in at any point in time and use this. So how usable is it? There's a navigation tool that they put in and I don't, I think they're using, uh, I'm not sure who they use for the base map, but in this particular case, that's the entire uh, limits of the scan that we did. This is in slide L. Uh, there's a street uh, I want to go to. Um, it's a busy area. So let's go here. So it's pretty easy to um, go to another location. And so here we have this location. So to show you that there's LIDAR in the background, there's a measurement tool. I can do a length and I can measure the width of this apron uh, at, as it approaches the, um, the travel lane. And so that length is 80, uh, 58 feet wide. The XY is orthographic. This particular case, that line was pretty uh, level. There was a change in four inches. Could have been how I clicked it, not sure. Um, so let's go to the front. So this, this pole right here is, um, now see, I can click here, even though it's not straight down. What this tool calculates is the length of that uh, diagonal is 32 feet but the actual length is 12 feet over in the X, Y. So from here to here, but the height of it above where I picked the pavement is 30 feet, four inches. This is phenomenal. This is snake oil stuff. It's incredible. So uh, let's go down the highway just a little bit. We're gonna get an observation. All right, so that tree, that tree is, in the XY, it is 36 feet away from um, the street side of that curb. All right, so this is the measurement tool. By the way, if you didn't get virtual geomatics to do the feature extraction, you could at least have this. Um, they have an office in India that does the processing uh, for feature extraction. It's very competitive. Their hosting service is very competitive, very affordable. All right, so, but when they do the feature extraction and they host it in this particular uh, tool, so this is the extraction list we talked about. We're gonna load them up into this, um, into this um, screen and you can see them populating the screen. All right, so here we got curb, edge of pavement, edge of pavement over here. Um, you got various elements that they identify. This particular element, if I double click it, I'm gonna turn off um, the measuring tool. But if I click right here, so this is a pole. It gives everything an ID, gives it a height, um, above pavement or above ground here. And then uh, some other uh, features. So let's keep going. So we go down the highway. If I wanna jump to another um, place along the road, 
Uh, I went to the end, I'm so sorry. So we're not gonna go to the end. We're gonna go back, let's just go right here. This is a very busy interchange, intersection. All right, so here's an intersection. Uh, you saw how we can measure heights from everywhere. But these are all observable, let me see if I can, these are all observable uh, points in the, uh, in the database, in the, in the extracted feature list. Oh, that's the power pole behind here. Oh, they measured all of the uh, parts and appurtenances on this pole. In fact, let me go forward a little bit. In the utility business, particularly the uh, electric and uh, uh, cable, telecom, uh, this is pretty neat. But anyway, they have all these uh, points on the pole. Now, granted, uh, we wouldn't extract this for a highway job, but for a utility job, it might be useful. Um, We've had discussions with the energy about this. They love it. All right, so I can't spend too much time on that. All right, so I gotta go back to the presentation. Here we are. All right, so let's keep going. Now I'm gonna give you an example. Um, so survey light in summary, quick, safe, mobile data collection, panorama imagery, we process LIDAR, we go back out, improve the accuracy. So this is all great stuff for the application of pre-construction and pre-design, uh, cracks, yard, pre-construction, ditches, all of that. We're gonna uh, produce LIDAR and imagery that, can, that with the right tools can provide measurement capabilities. We're gonna uh, post-process and provide AutoCAD files, DGN files, shape files. This is all great for a strip map. So if we drop in the high-res georeference images, the base maps, We've created a really good uh, base map, strip map, with which to plan uh, future design concepts, et cetera. And if you're, a, um, if you're a facility manager like the city of Baton Rouge, you do this um, hopscotch around, the next thing you know, you're building a, a database that's very useful for the future. All right, so the, the opportunity in, in Move BR, um, a lot of you know Booth BR is going through an improvement program for its street system, uh, spending close to a billion dollars, uh, program managers involved. Uh, a lot of projects have moved forward. Every one of them has a team. Um, these are complicated projects because they are in capacity uh, widening a lot. And in an urban environment, uh, it's not easy to widen, right? You've got all kinds of constraints with underground utilities, above ground utilities, uh, congested right away, close buildings, et cetera. So um, a lot of the, in fact, most of these uh, projects have involved a preliminary design phase that is focused on uh, what are the design concepts? What are the alternatives? What's the best alternative? And so there's been a reluctance and rightly so to do full blown topo, topographic surveying of all these traffic corridors, because if you move to one side, why did you survey the other side, right? If you expand to one side. So uh, we approached the city parish and they were really interested, but Loop Baton Rouge had already left the train station with a lot of these teams. But what the, our idea was, was to offer this planning concept. We were, they needed sufficient topographic utility data to conceptualize options for the needed highway improvements. So, without performing the full-blown survey, and we, we were gonna you know, give them survey light. We were gonna save money, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the solution was survey light. We were gonna wind up surveying everything using survey light so that the team surveyor later could come back and survey exactly what needed to be surveyed with high degree accuracies, typically uh, the kind that you know, the city would have for a highway design or DOTD for a highway design, and we talked a little bit about that earlier. So uh, we we would, you know, for 25% of the cost of conventional topo survey, uh, we really, you know, improve a lot, and then we save a lot of money so that they don't have to survey the entire area. Okay, enough of that. So for this particular idea, uh, there were 39 projects. Uh, we were gonna scan and process them all. We were gonna gather Sioux records um, underground, data uh, at quality level C to add to the maps. Uh, everything was gonna be uh, processed to state plane coordinates, Louisiana South Zone. And then we were gonna give the deliverables uh, that we just talked about 
since this is mapping, there weren't going to be a certification or, or a, a, a licensed stamp. So the scope was just pretty much everything we just talked about. We scan all the corridors, we drive down side streets for whatever is needed. Uh, we produce all the panorama imagery LIDAR data. Our LIDAR data can safely go out or accurately go out 300 feet, but that's more than enough. We were talking 100, 200 feet from the center of the outside lanes. Most of these roads are already four lane. Uh, so <clears throat> we were gonna go out, observe control uh, and validation points. And then we were gonna process it again against control. We were gonna get aerial imagery either from the city parish or from another source. Again, current georeferenced, uh, lay it in. Uh, we were gonna send off a lot of our data, ladybug imagery, virtual geomatics, they were going to produce AutoCAD files or DGN files, but generally AutoCAD files. We were going to provide DEMs that either we produced or they produced. Uh, everybody would have access, including the city, uh, to the VG uh, Virtual Geomatics hosted website. What a tool that everybody can use um, and talk about and share. So, and then at the end of all this, we're giving the video files to the city. Um, that's no big deal. Um, we give the imagery, we give the AutoCAD files that we had generated. All right, so to do all of that, we estimated $240,000 for all 39 projects, which is about 127,000 feet of center line of road. Uh, that's not center line of each um, lane, it's just the entire center line. So that equates to $6,154 per project, $1.88 per center line foot. It includes scans in two directions, and then it also included processing of all the data, production of a DEM, and then that host the files. What it did not include, because we didn't get to first base, uh, it didn't include the SUE um, work to produce a quality level C. All right, so why? I, um, an employee of mine shared this with me, and um, when the client says you can do it cheaper, uh, well, that's not the way you do it. Uh, you do it with survey light. Um, that's our that's our plan. All right, so about SJB Group, these are the markets we're active in. On the left, 40-man um, firm, uh, professional services, technical skills, and assisting the built environment. 